So this video is going to be a review on the basics of redox reactions. And redox reactions, otherwise known as oxidation reduction reactions, consist of two processes, one being the oxidation process, one being the reduction process. And the oxidation is actually the process of losing electrons, and reduction is a process of gaining electrons. Now, these are complementary processes, so they must occur together. Where there is oxidation, there must be reduction and vice versa. And the reason for that is because electrons as matter must be conserved. So the number of electrons lost in the oxidation process must be the exact same number as those gained in the reduction process. So they're very much like a complementary um, two processes. So what is the result of that? Well, the result for oxidation reduction reactions is mainly seen in the charge of that particular atom based on whether it gained or lost electrons. And we call charge in redox reactions oxidation numbers or oxidation states rather than charges. So the process of losing electrons, which are negative charges, would result in an increase in the oxidation number. Whereas the gaining of those negative electrons would, of course, decrease the charge or oxidation number. So how can you spot a redox reaction? Well, there's not an easy way, but we can look for some what we call key players. Typically, key players in redox reactions are metals, which might go against another metal, or metals that go up against hydrogen atoms, which turn to hydrogen gas, H2. So it does not mean that nonmetals other than hydrogen do not undergo redox reactions. No, they certainly can. But the main key players, of course, that we can look for to spot redox reactions easily are metals and hydrogen, and those are ones that you probably see on your activity series or your standard reductions table. So here is a hallmark redox reaction where zinc is reacting with hydrochloric acid, and one chemical property of acids is that when they react with metals, they produce hydrogen gas. So right away we, know we see that that's the metals versus H characteristic, and that gives us an inclination that this could be a redox reaction, but that's not proof enough. So really the only way to determine if this was a redox reaction is to look at the before, meaning the reactants, oxidation states, and the after, or the products, re oxidation states, and see if that has changed. If it has changed, meaning if the charge has changed, then electrons have been either lost or gained some exchange of electrons has occurred, and that's essentially what redox reactions are, electron exchange reactions. Therefore, we need to look at charges on the left side of the arrow and the right side, and then do a before and after comparison. If charges have changed, we can classify this as a redox reaction, and then we can delve more deeply into the subject. So let's take a look at zinc here. Zinc is a metal all by itself, meaning it is a simple neutral atom on its own. So the oxidation state here would be zero. Now HCl is a compound. The only way we can determine charges is by breaking up this compound into the H and the Cl. The H is a plus and the Cl is a minus just going by normal charges. Again, the reason why these have charges is because they're part of a compound. The only way this compound would have formed is if there were unlike charges that attracted one another to form the compound. The zinc has nothing attached to it because it had no electrical charge to attract anything. So by itself, zero, but in a compound, we do have cations and anions. Let's look over here to zinc chloride. Zinc is typically a plus two charge, and chlorine is still a one minus. Two one minuses is two minus for the chlorines, those two minuses balance the two plus of the zinc. Again, what we're looking is for one atom, one H, one Cl, one zinc, one of these Cls. This H2, again, 
is just plain hydrogen by itself as a diatomic ion. It's a gas. It is not part of a compound. Therefore, it has an oxidation state of zero. So have charges changed? Let's take a look. Zinc here was a zero, and now it's plus two. So yes, for sure, zinc has changed from a zero to a positive two. Hydrogen was a plus one over here, and now it's a zero. So that two has changed from a plus one to zero. Chlorine was a minus one as a reactant, and it's still a minus one as a product. So chlorine did not undergo redox because it, its charge or oxidation state did not change. So let's take a look and see what's going on. Zinc had an oxidation state that increased, which means it was likely oxidized. Hydrogen went from a plus one to a zero. Its oxidation number was decreased, therefore it likely underwent a reduction. So this was an oxidation and this was the reduction. Let's take a closer look at exactly what has happened by writing half reactions. And by half, what we mean is the oxidation half and the reduction half, not the, re the reactant half and the product half. The oxidation and the reduction, meaning if zinc was indeed oxidized, what happened to it is its oxidation half reaction. Zinc is a solid, became zinc 2 plus. Okay, we don't care about chlorine. It's a spectator ion at this point. We're only interested in the key players. What has happened amongst them? What kind of electron exchange has occurred between these two atoms? All other atoms really are just spectator at this point. So zinc went from a zero to a two plus. So zinc solid to a two plus. How did it become a two plus? Because it must have lost two electrons. So zinc decomposes to form zinc two plus and two electrons. Those same two electrons then that are being lost, electron loss, would be making zinc oxidized. Those electrons must be gained somewhere. Where are they gained? Right here with the hydrogen. Hydrogen was a plus one here, and now it's a zero here. How many hydrogens? Two of them. Two hydrogen pluses gained two electrons. Each of them gained one, meaning that they each were neutralized to form an H2 molecule that has zero charge. Notice how the electrons here are your spectators. So if we were to add these equations together, it would be zinc plus 2H plus, because that's what the left half looks like right now. And when zinc relinquishes its electrons and hydrogen accepts them, the zinc becomes oxidized to a 2 plus charge while the H2 becomes reduced. And you can see they've just simply exchanged places with one another. We call this a single displacement reaction because one thing is displacing the other. One atom displaces the other. So this is how we write half reactions. Half reactions help us to see the number of electrons lost versus the number of electrons gained. You can see that because we were able to balance this equation at the very top by having this coefficient of 2 in front of HCl, that provided the two hydrogens that were necessary to, to accept both of those electrons. Zinc is losing two electrons. It's a take it or leave it scenario. It doesn't want to lose one. It wants to lose two. It wants to find one or more atoms that will accept both, both of those two electrons. That means that if each hydrogen gains one electron and we need two electrons to be gained, we need two hydrogen atoms to gain those two electrons. So that two we see here. All right, and again here you can see that we've got one zinc, one zinc, two H's and two H's and all is balanced zero and two plus is two plus on the left side and two plus and zero is two plus on the right side. Atoms are conserved 
and charges are conserved, which means electrons are conserved. Everything's got to match up. So how did we know these charges up here? These are pretty much the charges that you would learn in any basic level of chemistry. But we do have some guidelines to either remind you or to help you set some guidelines um, or rules for determining oxidation number. The first of which that are, is that free elements in an uncombined state have an oxidation number of zero. This is what rule we used to determine that zinc was zero. But this is the one that we also used to say that H2 was zero. So any free atom on its own, of course, is going to have an oxidation state of zero. Let's keep coming down to this second guideline or rule. In monoatomic ions, the oxidation number is equal to whatever charge you find on that ion. So if you see lithium plus one, the oxidation state is plus one. If you see iron that's plus three, then iron's oxidation number is plus three, and so forth. So if you're already told the charge, then the work has been done for you. Go with it. Oxidation numbers for oxygen and hydrogen. I usually call these go-to atoms because you can almost always count on them to be their, risk, the, their normal charges. Oxidation number of oxygen is usually negative two and most of the time you can count on that. Oxidation number of hydrogen is usually positive one. You can pretty much count on that. However, there are some notable exceptions. In a peroxide, in H2O2, an oxygen in a peroxide atom will have an oxidation state of negative one. And a superoxide, an O2 two minus atom will also have a, an oxidation state of negative one half for oxygen. But these are very rare to see. So really in most instances, you can assume that oxygen is a minus two and kind of use that as one of your known atoms. Hydrogen, by the same token, typically has a plus one charge. And you can almost always expect that, unless it is paired or bonded to a metal. And you know metals are always positively charged. So they will always have the priority of being the cation. Should a hydrogen atom bond with a metal, it will have to, as to assume a negative one charge. But most of the time, hydrogen is bonded to another nonmetal allowing it to remain as one of our known atoms that we can count on, our go-to atoms. And in that case, we can almost always count on it to remain positive one. All right, what other knowns do we have? Well, group one metals, we can assume to be positive one. That's good. Group two metals, we can assume to be positive two. And of the non-metals, the only one that is a given or a known is fluorine. Fluorine will always be a minus one because it is so electronegative, it will always retain that negative one charge. So those are what we can count on. Oxygen, hydrogen, group one and two metals, as well as fluorine. Now, what do we mean by known? It's that you've learned basic charges according to the periodic table for most atoms. And that means that those are their typical charges. But that doesn't mean that they cannot change their charges or oxidation states. Chlorine, for example, has many oxidation states, everything from a negative one to a positive one, to a positive three, positive five, positive seven, and the list goes on and on for different atoms having different oxidation states. It's like having different personalities. Which personality is this particular atom exhibiting in this particular instance, in this particular compound. It can change, just like a mood or a personality changes for a person based on the situation that they happen to be in. So, how can we determine the unknowns, the atoms whose oxidation numbers do change in redox reactions? How do we determine what version of themselves they are playing in a particular compound. We use the knowns and this rule here to help us determine what the unknown value is simply by using algebra. Now you can do this in your head or you can use simple algebra to determine this. But this rule says that the sum of oxidation numbers of all the atoms in a molecular ion is equal to the charge on the molecular ion. 
So what does that mean? Let's take a look at HNO3, nitric acid. What this rule tells us is that hydrogen's charge or oxidation number and that of nitrogen and that of three oxygens should all add up to the charge on the overall compound, which is zero because you can see there's no charge here. That means we assume it's neutral. So that means hydrogen plus nitrogen plus three oxygens should equal zero. Now you can see that hydrogen is at one of our givens. It's going to be a plus one. Oxygen is one of our givens. It's a minus two. So we can actually plug those in. Hydrogen is a plus one. Nitrogen is our unknown. And oxygen is also one of our knowns because we know that we have three of them times negative two apiece and the addition of hydrogen and nitrogen and all the charges we acquire from oxygen three times the negative two we get negative six total from oxygen that should all add up to zero so positive one plus negative six is negative five so nitrogen minus five is equal to zero and that means nitrogen in this instance has an oxidation state of positive five let's try another one this atom is also neutral because I don't see any charge. Should there have been a charge like in ammonium, you would have seen it. But there is no charge here, so everything should add up to zero. In something like ammonium, the nitrogen and the four hydrogens charges would have to add up to positive one. Here, again, we have neutral. So we have two potassiums, we have two chromiums, and we have four oxygens and all those charges should add up to zero so again what is our known well potassium is in group number one so that means you can count on that to be a positive one charge so two times positive one is positive two that is the total charge from potassium chromium is the transition metal so already that may be some insight that it's going to be our, our unknown but to confirm that, we see we have oxygen here, and oxygen is not one of the exceptional cases. Again, most of the time it won't be, so we can count on it to be a minus two. So four atoms of oxygen times minus two apiece gives us minus eight from that oxygen. So all those added together should be zero. So two times plus one is plus two, plus two chromiums, plus four times negative two is negative eight all that should equal zero so positive two plus negative eight is negative six negative six plus our two chromiums from here and that should equal zero all right so what next let's solve for chromium move the six over to the other side that's two CR is equal to positive six divide by the two that means each chromium is worth how much positive six divided by two is positive three because if two chromiums is positive six each one should be plus three three times two is of course the six so now we know that chromium in this particular instance has a charge of positive three